Bison family. Welcome to this edition of Forward Thinking at Bison Roundtable. I'm Sharon Strange-Lewis, Director of Alumni Relations for Howard University. Thank you for joining us today as we tackle a topic that is dear to me, a topic that many have sacrificed their life for, a topic that many are being denied access to. We have assembled an esteemed group of Howard thought leaders and an alumni expert to discuss voting, voter registration, and how to create your individual voting plan. Because now more than ever, it is important that we wanna make sure my vote, your vote, and our vote counts. Paul Matero, Assistant Vice President of External Affairs for, for Howard University is today's moderators. Paul, let the round table begin. Thank you so much, Sharon, and to the entire alumni relations team uh, for hosting this important conversation today. Uh, my name is Paul Montero. I have the privilege of serving as the Assistant Vice President of External Affairs here at Howard. I'm a proud graduate of the law school. Um, but most importantly, we are joined by some of the brightest lights in this space uh, to really dig deeper into not only the history and uh, contemporary relevance of this topic, but also what we must do to raise our voices and make sure that we exercise uh, the, the rights that so many uh, fought and died to earn for us. Uh, Howard University, where you all know our motto is truth and service, um, is, is very well known in the space of public service. When you think back uh, of the, the luminaries that have been trained and or taught here, um, the first African-American Supreme Court Justice, Justice Thurgood Marshall, Howard Law Class of 1933, uh, going through Ambassador Andrew Young, uh, United Nations Ambassador, in addition to his work in the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, when you look at uh, Anamiri Baraka and Ossie Davis, uh, Patricia Roberts Harris, the first black woman in, in the president's cabinet, uh, you have on and on a, 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 a legacy of luminaries um, in the political science space, like a Ronald Walters, who we'll hear more about uh, as we go on, or an Alvin Thornton, um, and, and certainly a bipartisan record in elected office um, in the Senate with a Senator Edward Brooke, a Republican from Massachusetts, uh, Senator Roland Burris from uh, Illinois, and Senator Kamala Harris, uh, the, the Senator from California and uh, a candidate on a major party ticket for Vice President of the United States. So it's nothing new for Howard to be in this critical space as we talk about uh, the importance of participating in these electoral processes. I'm joined by uh, three luminaries. Uh, two are on the line at the moment. We'll be joined by Dr. Kanisha Grant momentarily. Dr. Elsie Scott is someone I had the privilege of working with. I first met her when she was the executive director of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, and I was on the White House staff under President Obama, uh, where Dr. Scott was royalty on the Hill. Uh, the amount of influence and respect that she had um, on the Hill and beyond um, is, is hard to, to explain, but I'm so glad that she can be with us here in her role as the executive director of the Ronald Walters Leadership and Public Policy Center. Priestley Johnson, an alumna who's already changing the world through her work. She's currently the deputy director of partnerships and outreach uh, at When We All Vote, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that's focused on increasing participation in American elections at every level, inspired by Mrs. Michelle Obama. Uh, so thank you both for being here. And Thanks, it's always important to start with why. Why, why, are, why are we even talking about this issue? And to make it real plain and relevant, I thought it best to start with Dr. Scott, because Dr. Scott has not only studied, worked in the space, but she, she has lived through uh, some of why this is so important. So maybe Dr. Scott, you can just um, set that context for us. Yes. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to talk about this topic because it's something I have grown up with because as a child, my father was fighting for the right to vote for African-Americans in uh, East Carroll Parish, Louisiana. At that time, when I was growing up, there were no Blacks registered to vote and no Blacks had been registered to vote since uh, after Reconstruction. And they were forced off the rolls. And my father, tried many years, at least about 15 years, I think it, he worked actively to try to get the right to vote before he finally won the right. Uh, they tried all kinds of things such as uh, the registrar voters, the clerical court would hide 
and locked the door and pretend that she wasn't there. Then she gave them literacy tests. And when they mastered the test, then they came up with another way in the state of Louisiana, you had to have an a voter ID, but it was different from the voter ID today. The voter ID at that time, you had to have two registered voters who vouched for the fact that you were upstanding citizens. And every registered voter was white and no black person could find a white person in my town, even though white uh, black people worked for them. There was nobody who could identify any black person as being upstanding enough to register to vote. And uh, my father, there was a woman who said that, she said, well, I know my white people that I work for, they are good people and they will, reg they will identify me. So he met her down at the courthouse and they never showed up. And mm. so finally, my father had to go to the courts and that's how he finally got registered to vote. He and my mother were registered in the federal court and they were probably the first I've heard of people who vote ID card was signed by a federal judge instead of a clerk of court, even though this is a state function. Wow, and that's, that's what you came up in and saw and had your family experience. And I, I don't think any one of us uh, thinks that that, you know, while those are egregious examples, the spirit behind uh, those efforts uh, are, 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 are even conditions we're living in in some parts of this country today. Uh, so it's important to recognize that this is not a new a conversation. It's, it's taken on increasing importance as the efforts uh, to discourage or, or keep people from voting have become maybe even more subtle, but no less real. I wanted to turn to uh, Priestley, you know, the work that, that When We All Vote is doing. Um, can, can, you, can you just start with sort of a, a quick overview of the important uh, work that When We All Vote is doing? Yes, definitely. Uh, when We All Vote was started in 2018, about uh, six months before the 2018 election by Mrs. Obama, as well as, well as some uh, other celebrity voices that she thought could lend their voices to uh, increasing voter participation. And so what she saw was that um, in 2016, only, uh, only 41% 40, uh, of the actual eligible Americans in this country did not even cast their ballots to vote. So that means that we didn't really have a fully representative democracy. It doesn't matter which side you're voting on. Um, almost half of our um, citizens did not even turn out to vote. And so what our, the goal of uh, When We All Vote is, is, is to change the culture around voting. And by changing the culture, we want it to be ingrained in the way that society functions. It's not something that happens every four years or it's only pre presidential elections. We are trying to hone in on, on every election, all the way from the president, all the way down to your local head of your school board. We want you to participate and we want your voice to be heard because when decisions are making, we wanna make sure that you know that be they're being made on your behalf and you have a, a representative that um, reflects your own ideals, whatever they may be. And so at When We All Vote, we, we, use, uh, we, we use this platform and we're growing this platform specifically to increase voter participation. I'm happy to share more about it. And, and I'm really excited about our partnership with Howard University because this partnership specifically for me as an alumna means so much, but it also means a lot for our country. It means that uh, there, there is uh, almost hundreds of thousands of Howard alumni that are out there in the world and there's students that are on campus and they can be using, uh, we have a training coming up and they could be using their voices to um, to really amplify that in this upcoming election. And so what we've done is we've partnered with Howard University to ensure that uh, our alumna, our staff, our, 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 uh, our teachers, uh, our current students can get the resources and tools to spread the word about voter education and voter participation and making sure everyone is registered and has a plan to vote this upcoming year. That's exciting, absolutely. A new partnership with Howard University and many other institutions. We're, we're glad to be with you. And, and as we go further into the conversation, you'll be sure to share next steps because we wanna make sure that this, this uh, conversation is very much focused on why we're discussing it, but what we can do um, to move the needle on, on, the, on the importance of increasing participation in these elections. Dr. Scott, 
now serves as the lead at the Ron Walters Center. And, and I don't want to miss that th this man that the center is named after and, and the work that he did, we, we, can't, we can't have this conversation without touching on that briefly. So Dr. Scott, can you just share, I, I'm sure most people know, but for maybe those that, that are less familiar with who he was and why we went and named a center after him uh, on, on this issue. Yeah, Ron Walters was the former professor at Howard University. He spent about 25 years at Howard. He served as chair of the political science department for about nine years. But beyond, you know, beyond just being a professor at Howard, he was also known throughout the country and the political world, really, because he was very active as being uh, what we call a scholar activist. And that's what the center was set up around the whole concept of scholar activism. And what that means is that you do research, but then you do research that's going to be applicable, that people can take and use in order to be involved in their communities. So uh, Ron Walters worked with a lot of different groups. He helped to found the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, and then he was very active in the uh, Free South Africa movement. And he was the key advisor, strategic advisor for Jesse Jackson for both his uh, terms of trying to run for president of the United States. And so he was well known, he worked with a lot of groups. And one of the things that he started that we have continued at the center, he started a command center, a command, uh, I guess, yeah, a command center for election day, where he would have uh, students who would do exit polling, and they would study why people are voting, what's driving the black vote. And he partnered with the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation, uh, which I serve on their board now. And we continue to do this on election day. We have expanded it because we are set up at Howard University on the campus. Ron used to be more out in the community, but we have opened it where students can, well, we won't be able to do that this year because of COVID, but traditionally we've had, uh, We've had a place where students could come and they can interact with people on the ground in about eight states. They did exit polling last uh, 2016. We sent students to North Carolina and to Ohio and they helped with the get out to vote. And they did exit polling, they produce, uh, we published their exit poll when they got back the results of that. So this is carrying on the legacy, carrying on the legacy of Ron Walters. And I'm sure he probably smiling down upon us that we are still continue to try to do the things that he started. Thank you for sharing more about this this legend uh, in 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 scholarship. And and got to give a shout out to uh, Mrs. Patricia Walters as well, another major friend of Howard University. She um, has um, generously donated um, as as she collected black art over decades. I mean, I actually made a gift of one of the largest collections to the university, I believe last year, uh, valued it at a couple of million dollars. So if you're listening, Ms. Walters, we love you too. And thank you for all you do for HU. Um, I, I remember from my time on the Obama campaign 2008, I'm gonna tell a, a quick story and get your reaction on. <clears throat> 2008, one of the hardest communities for a Senator Obama to tap into, to get people excited or, to the point where they would say, I'm supporting him, I'm gonna vote for him. Uh, we, you know, several focus groups would show the number one reason that many would give in the black community was some variant of they won't let him win. The sense that it doesn't matter what I do because the powers that be won't allow this man to be elevated to that office. Um, but if we could get at the underpinnings of that and show people that it, it actually does matter what you do, it, this is not a foregone conclusion. You have the ability through using your voice, exercising your right uh, to, to, to influence the outcome. Um, how would you, and, and I would love to hear from both of you on this, we'll start maybe starting with Priestley. How, how do you get at that issue, especially as we talk about, you know, the black vote, um, and I would love to, to sort of define that term further, um, but how do you get at the, the, the motivation around getting people to understand that what they do matters? Yeah, I, I think I get this question all the time. And I think 
there is so much validity to this question because I understand. I understand what it's like to be a black person in this country and you feel you feel a bit stifled. And I understand that and that is an under that's just you know, I understand where that comes from. However, I think there's so many other venues where we can have our voices heard and we can uh, and we can actually elevate uh, elevate our perspective. And really that comes from electing people in office that represent our values. And so sometimes, I, and, and also, especially when we're talking uh, about electing people that reflect our values and we're connecting it to the real person on the ground who lives their day, they wake up every morning, they go to work, they come back, they try to feed their kids and they try to, you know, have conversations with their kids and they, you know, they're trying to build a, a lifestyle for um, their next generation. How do we connect it to those people that are living that life? And so what my, um, what my recommendation is, is to make real life connections between what's going on in the world with elected people elected into office. And so one example right now, especially uh, in this new, uh, in this uh, kind of uprising and, and ad advocacy that's happening for uh, black people to live really right now is I would connect it to this moment uh, in time where we are advocating for black lives to matter. And, and we can say, you know, uh, when, uh, for example, Breonna Taylor's, uh, uh, Breonna Taylor's killers are still out there, that her murderers are still out there and, and the who actually can take action right now are their district attorney and being able to say, oh, there's one person's life that was affected by a decision we all could have collaborated on when it comes to the person that was elected into office, that district attorney that should be taking action right now. So now we should be looking at all the district attorneys. Are they reflective? Do they have the same values that we have? When we're looking at um, even uh, COVID-19 and, and relating that issue to the way that we're operating in our lives, we're trying to keep our kids safe. We're trying to keep ourselves sa safe, our elders safe. How, who are the people in our community that have that responsibility in their job titles? And who, how are we electing them into office? And so when you look at states like Georgia, where there is a mayor that's taking action, as well as a governor taking action, and the duality of those two, um, uh, those, the, the duality of those two point of views, and see who relates most to you, and then see if you can, um, and, and know that those actual jobs are jobs that you can vote on and you're like oh these people it's in their job um, description to keep us safe and this is kind of when things hit the fan are beautiful ways to draw connections to people and say hi that is how your life directly um, is impacted by people you elect into office and that's how um, you can make the connection especially with black people they need to see that there is a connection to their life and these are two great examples you can take and run and take them to the bank because people are able to make that connection right then and there. Absolutely, again, to the relevance piece. Dr. Scott, what would you say in terms of getting people to understand just why this is so critical to their day-to-day? -day? Well, first I wanna thank Priestley for really making it plain because so many places don't teach civics anymore. We had civics when I was growing up, it taught you about government and what the role of government. Now we don't have that. So many people don't understand. But then the older people, they know what they have lived through and many of them don't believe that they can trust the system because they have lived through years of voter suppression. And there have been so many different methods of voter suppression. Because you know, when I told my father's story, in 1962, he and my mother and uh, there were 22 of them who were registered to vote. But then there weren't many other black people who were allowed to vote because the registrar voters quit rather than uh, register black people. And so they had to go back to court to try to win that. And, and then on the day that they won the right uh, to have a registrar voter come and register these people, then they shot my father that night. And so that was a form of intimidation. My father lived, but that was designed to scare people. And don't register vote. Even if you get registered, you still may get killed. And so they've seen mega efforts and other people get killed in the South. And then they also saw harassment. They saw people's businesses burn. 
they, in my hometown, there was a man who had a lot of farmland. They wouldn't gin his cotton. So his children had to drop out of college because they couldn't, he didn't have the money to send them, even though he should have because he had plenty land and he had plenty of cotton, but they cut him off economically. So uh, we've had all of these different voter suppressions. And even today, uh, I'd like to mention the Shelby versus Holder mm. uh, Supreme Court decision, because we got the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Yeah. And many people got registered to vote and they were voting. Mm -hmm. And under the Voting Rights Act, it allowed certain protections for people who had been intimidated. And what we have in 19, what, in 2013, we have the Supreme Court that rules that basically we don't need this anymore because everything is good and black people and Hispanic people, they can get registered to vote and nobody's gonna intimidate them so we shouldn't have be punishing these states in the South by telling them they had to uh, present all of their changes in election rules to the Justice Department and have them approved before they could put them in, in effect. But what happened right after that, even before, even before the Supreme Court decision, you had a lot of states changing their voting laws and requiring this new form of ID. So it's no longer having two white people or two registered voters uh, uh, identify you. Now you have to have a card. And this card is different things in different states. And it had to sometime, it, your name had to match exactly mm -hmm. what's on the identification and what you signed with the voter registration roll. And in, uh, interesting, in Texas, you could get registered ID, an acceptable ID was your hunting license, uh, but not your college ID. And so that was designed to intimidate college students. So we've had a whole series of intimidations and you would think that in 2020 that we would not have all of these suppression methods uh, still in place, but we got even more, you know, since we, uh, since we no longer have the protections that were under the Civil Rights Act of 1965. I think Priestley's trying to jump in here with something. <laughs> no, I, I'm like right here with you because I think I think there's something to say when people are are constantly trying to infringe on something. Why is there so much attention to the black vote? Why is there so many eyes? Why are they? Why is it a constant conversation? Why after? Um, uh, almost hundreds of years of us fighting for this right. How, why is it still something that is being targeted? And it's because it has value. And that because when we turn out to vote, we have the uh, we have the option to be fully represented in this country. And that has always. And I love the fact that Dr. Scott just went through the history of voter suppression because that is that is its own thing. But now in this day and age, we can actually point to how it's being used right now. We can see it. it's not something of the past. It's not something in our history books. This is something that it, we are dealing with right now. And I would just like to say for everyone out there, number one, pay attention. Why is this something that is, is a target? Because when things are a target, that means there must be power behind it. And then number two, how how can we raise awareness about the fact that this is happening and how can we counter it? And there's a lot of election protection hotlines, I believe, uh, 411 vote um, is is 1-800-411 vote um, or vote 411. I'm, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll make sure we have that in our follow up. But um, there's a, an, an election protection hotline you can you can actually connect to. But also think about election day. It's not too early to start thinking about November 3rd and how are we going to make sure that everyone's vote, vote is heard? How are we going to going to counter this this history of voter suppression and make sure that we have options on November 3rd. So we can already predict lines will be long. So let's make sure our elders have some chairs. Let's bring out the long chair, the lawn, the lawn chairs and figure it out. Let's got some bottled waters. Let's make sure that there's bathrooms. Let's get some food trucks and make sure everyone is fed. But one thing we're not going to do is we're not going to get out of the line and we're, we're also going to make a plan to vote. So if we're not going to be in that line, we're going to make sure we're voting by mail. We're, we're requesting our ballots now, not waiting until next month 
month, not waiting till the month after that, or on election day to request your ballot. We're going to do it now because we are understanding that, especially speaking directly to my Howard uh, community, we're, we're Black. We need to make sure that our voices are heard um, because there's a target on it. And so we should definitely understand that there's power, there's an abundance of power behind that, that we have and we can hold and we can leverage. And that's a great, uh, that's a great segue into where we need to go next, because as Dr. Scott's covered some of the historical games that have been played, tactics employed, violence deployed against uh, people trying to exercise their right to vote. And Priestley, you're really putting your finger on, this is some contemporary things going on right now. At a moment where we have a pandemic going on, mm -hmm. there's a whole conversation around voting by mail. There's different rules and timelines depending on where you live. And, and there's a lot of confusion. And yeah. how, how can our listeners and the people in their sphere of influence, what would you tell them and advise them in terms of making a plan here on this day in, you know, when we're recording this in, in August, elections very, you know, very, very, very close. What, how do we start to think through a plan? Yeah. For their community? And I, I love it because I, I am, I think especially women, we love a good plan and we love, we, we love a good step by step. So here we go. I, I know our men, our men do, do well, but let me tell you what the plan is and we're going to follow this. So we are less than uh, 75 days until the upcoming election. We cannot afford to be paying attention to these distractions that are out there. We need to stay focused. And so what we all can do right now is to make your voting plan um, to vote, vote early now. And so the more states that are, are, that are um, doing early voting, that's exactly the states we really wanna focus on because those are the states where you can actually go in person to vote early. I want you to really figure out if you are voting in a state that allows early voting, which also allows you to space out your time between people. And it's also COVID friendly should you want to actually vote in person. However, if you are interested in voting by mail, and I really highly um, uh, recommend that you vote by mail, that you can actually request your ballots right now if you are in any of the following states. If you are in Arizona, if you're in Florida, Georgia, um, Indiana, uh, Maine, Michigan, Minnesota, North Carolina, um, South Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Texas, Virginia, or Wisconsin, you can actually request your ballots right now. Do it right now. And where you can go for that information is you can go to whenweallvote.org, whenweallvote.org, backslash VRH for our voter registration hub. Voter registration hub, VRH. So, and you can just go right to our website. It's honestly one of the first things that's going to catch your eye. And that's our voter registration hub for you to figure out all the resources that are available to you to make that plan. Several states also allow ballot tracking. And so you're going to be able to keep an eye on your application and your ballot. So look into those states that do allow you to actually track, track your ballot and ensure that it is counted. And so through our um, voter registration resources hub, you're going to be able to find information on how you can return your ballot. Number one, you can mail it in and you want to mail it back in as early as possible. Fill that out the day you get it. Send that in the mail the next day. The next option that you have is you can vote, drop it off in person and you can drop it off in person and a lot of these places you just need to drive up and put it into a little slot and you're good you know i know understand it's covid 19 we want to restrict our you know interpersonal relationships and so our job is to make sure that you know where to go you can drop it off in person and you can check where to drop it off also on our voter registration hub and then our last thing is that you can actually drop it in person on election day um, and on election day, I believe there's going to be some safe and secure and convenient ways on which you can just drop it off and you don't have to stand in, in that line to make sure that your, your, um, your vote is counted. And for all of these planning options, it is going to be difficult. And I understand that it's going to be challenging this year more than ever. But 
I say we climb this mountain now so we don't have to climb this mountain in another four years or in another four years. And whoever we elect into office, we're going to be holding them accountable for increasing um, access to uh, the ballot box. And we need to make sure we're holding people accountable to expand access, not even to hold it where it's at. We need to make sure that this system, it works for every state, 50 states across our entire nation. Um, but yes, go to our website, whenweallvote.org backslash VRH for our voter registration hub. And then our election protection hotline, I actually have the number. It is 1-866-OUR-VOTE. That is 1-866-OUR-VOTE to ensure that, it, that if you are experiencing any difficulties when it comes to casting your ballot, that you can go to that, uh, you can call that hotline and you can make sure that uh, more people are aware of any issues that you are facing. So two resources that you have available to you. May I add a few things yes. to this uh, plan? First thing, I think we need to make certain that people are registered to vote. Yep. And so now, it's the time to find if you're registered to vote. Now you say, okay, I voted four years ago. Yep. It depends on what state you're in as to whether you're still registered because so many states have these laws now where they purge you off the roll if you don't, you don't vote in any election. So it can, it's no longer can you just vote in the presidential election. You yep. might have to vote in some of the local elections in order to stay registered. So check your voting status and I'm not sure whether your website, Priestly, will give them that, but I know vote.org, you can go and find out whether you are still registered, another a number of other sites you can find out. And yeah, on that voter registration hub, you can check your registration. Good, great. And then find out where your voting district is because it probably has moved because of the COVID. Many places are going to have fewer voting uh, poll places, so you need to find that out. Check with your family. How are they getting to the polls? Yep. And if they're not sure, okay, make a plan for them also mm -hmm. and make certain that they're going to get there. What about your neighbors? Uh, and then find out as much information as you can about the people who are running for office. Because there's nothing worse than getting inside the polling booth and somebody ahead of me is standing there trying to read every initiative that's on the ballot when they should have studied that before they got there. And then you hear people say, oh, I voted for him because his name sound black. As you recall in South Carolina, I think it was about six or seven years ago, and this man won and he was an ex-con, did not spend any money on campaigning, but he had a black sound name, well, he was black, but it was just sort of a joke to him to get on the ballot and he won and then he didn't know what to do. So we need to make sure we research the candidates before we go to vote and know who you're going to vote for. Now, many states, you can't take a cheat sheet. Yeah. You used to could take your ballot in with you, but many states, you can't take a cheat sheet. So be careful about that. Also, what are you going to wear to the polls? There are some states that you cannot have on any kind of t-shirt that suggests anything about voting and activism. Maybe, I think there are a few states where Black Lives Matter may not be allowed. So make certain you don't get turned away from voting just because somebody said that what you had on your tire did not pass whatever's the state law. And make certain that you're not going to be intimidated. We're hearing now that there will be police officers, state, state patrols, sheriffs, et cetera, outside the polling booth. Mm -hmm. These are designed to intimidate people and make people afraid not to vote. And this is especially the case in uh, Latino communities where if they have people intimidated that they are going to get arrested, they're going to be taken in for voting. So, uh, and, and as uh, Priestley has already mentioned, is to have the voter protection phone number with you. But in a lot of polling places, there will be voter protection lawyers and other people there at the booth uh, so what you can do is you have any problems, people challenge you, you talk to one of the lawyers or there's this hotline where you call, I think it's 1-866-VOTE. Our vote, yes. Yeah, our vote. Okay, so, uh, and you just call, call that number so that uh, you can perhaps get a provisional ballot. 
And so a provisional ballot, if they challenge your registration, then you can vote, you can request a provisional ballot. Now, it's not sure whether a provisional ballot will be counted in every state, but at least you will get a chance to vote and you may be in one of those states where your provisional vote or where your provisional ballot will be counted. So you don't, you want to know how you're going to get to the poll. You want to know what, who you're going to vote for when you get there. You want to know what you're going to do if somebody, somebody intimidates you. And then you want to help your family and friends vote. Now there are a lot of uh, civic organizations that have information. The NAACP is across the country, has information on what's happening in your city where you can find out exactly what's happening and when you should vote, when you can vote, uh, because there are a lot of opportunities now where you can early vote. Mm -hmm. And because so, many older people don't trust the mail voting and they're seeing all the stuff on TV about what's happening with the post office. So what we can do is make sure that they get a chance to do early voting. And uh, so that they can see their vote going into the slot. I know some senior citizens say, okay, I need to see my vote go in that slot. And otherwise I think they'll be stealing my vote. So there's, you know, there's a lot to be, a lot to, to start preparing for. And it's good people are starting preparing now. I belong to the AME Church, and I know our bishop last week had uh, had a seminar, uh, an online event where people came on and talked about what what to do, how to prepare, and get ready. So there are a lot of churches doing that also. So I'm really happy that there are so many people engaged. Let me just say one thing about the the students at Howard. Many students at Howard and other colleges have registered to vote in the places where they attend school. And now they're gonna be home because of the COVID. They need to make certain that they can get absentee ballot and get it early enough. I know uh, at the last election in 2016, we were at the command center, some students showed up there and said, I came to pick up my absentee ballot. I said, this is election day. <laughs> and if you don't have an absentee ballot for Texas, you can forget it. And we had a lot of cases in Georgia where the absentee ballots of students were not counted. In fact, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and the Law, I think they were starting a suit against Georgia because they felt like so many students' absentee ballots were not accepted. So students need to start thinking about first where you registered, and then if you have to do an absentee ballot, how much time do you need? When is the earliest you can order your absentee ballot? Yeah. And then how do you get your absentee ballot in? <laughs> To say now, do it now. Don't don't wait. Well, and to the urgency piece, you know, remember from working campaigns, I would often tell people, you know, just the limits of polling. And and I would do a lot of work in the community. I would go to fish fry, church visits, and I would just ask people, raise your hand if a pollster has called your house, and nobody raised their hand. And I'm like, you know, get don't look at what you see on the TV screen or this computer screen as destiny, because these don't reflect any of your input. Um, and, and with the pandemic, um, I mean, we've seen several reports of, you know, the, how, how, how is voter registration tracking? It, it's tough now because we're in an environment where people can't get together. I know a standard approach has been, especially in the fall of a presidential election year, you're, you're dealing with football games, you're dealing with tailgates, you're dealing with, you know, church visits or, or the ability, homecomings, people coming together, you sign them up you know, when they're at the game or what have you. And, and now those things are all, so, you know, to the sense of urgency of like, this is not a normal year. I don't think anyone thinks that, but just to make it real clear, it's not a normal year. And there's a lot more nuance and variation about how this is going to go. And, um, you know, people really have to, I think, recognize that uh, uh, doing nothing is a choice and and doing nothing um in a year where there's no space for complacency um is making a choice i see we've been joined by dr kenesha grant author of the great migration oh yes and the democratic party um she's also a brilliant mind you may recognize her from her many media appearances and hdtv's house hunters uh <laughs> 
we've been talking, well, you, you and your, you, you know, and, and a lot of your work, we've been having a great conversation with Dr. Scott and Ms. Priestley Johnson. I wanted to give space here, since you've, you've studied these issues, you've worked campaigns yourself, um, and you teach in the political science department. Um, what, what's, you know, I guess, just to start with you, what, what's, how, do, how are you looking at the situation? Um, and what do you think that our listeners really need to be tracking as we around engagement in the voting process? I think off the top of my head, I am thinking about misinformation and disinformation this year. We at Howard are working on the Knight Foundation. We have a grant with the Knight Foundation where that's the question. We know for a fact that the folks who seek to sow discord in American discourse and who seek to confuse people are specifically focused on Black people. And so if you, I would say to the listeners, are getting messages about like voting doesn't matter, or, I don't really care about this and that kind of stuff, I would ask them to question where those messages come from. Because I think for the most part, if you talk to Black people, especially older Black people who have actually put their bodies on the line for these rights, they don't say things about voting doesn't matter, voting is not important. They're very clear that it's important and they're very clear that uh, the fact that they work so hard to keep these things from us demonstrate its importance, voting's importance. And so those are the things that are on my mind. And I think I echo some of the sentiment I heard as I was coming in about like to not make a choice is to make a choice. And so it's important that people get in the arena. We, I think, are on a nonpartisan thing here. And so we won't tell you how to get into the arena, but like get in there and make a decision, not just at the national level, but at the state and local level too. And, and earlier in the conversation, Ms. Johnson made the point around the, how critical it is at that local level, the local and state level, in terms of relevance as to why does my vote have anything to do with my day to day? Yeah. Can, can you go deeper on that? Yeah, so I, I'll talk about myself a little bit. Um, I live in Washington, DC, and I bought with my husband a home in October. And right in front of our house, there's a tree. The tree gave wonderful blossoms, not cherry blossoms, but wonderful blossoms this spring. It was great. And now that we're in the summer, half of the tree needs to be cut or it looks kind of like it's in disrepair, but half of it's beautiful. And so I was trying to figure out like, okay, if I call an arborist, how much is that going to cost me? But as I was doing the information about the arborist, it turns out that that's actually not my responsibility. That tree is on a city sidewalk. And the city is responsible to make sure that that tree is healthy and that the limbs don't fall all over the place. And so I could have been spending my money to have somebody fix the tree, but that's really a local government problem. Whether my trash is collected and how is a local government problem. Whether the power always goes out when it's hot or how people respond to fires, all of these things that we see in the news and kind of think about as big national problems, responses to hurricanes are local and state government problems. And so literally everything you do on a day-to-day -day basis, the, the water you're using to brush your teeth, all of that stuff is local and it's there and somebody's making decisions about it, whether you decide to participate in those decisions or not. That's, that's so on point. And, and just another reminder of these elections have consequences and, and we, we live in, in those consequences um, based on the choice we, we make or don't make. Um, as we start to bring this to a sort of a closure, I wanna make sure again, we're focused on action steps, next steps, the importance of coming up with, so it's the end of August, what is the plan? How do I make a plan? What should be a part of my plan? And so with these brilliant minds, all play, but put, put it out there. I know, I know Ms. Johnson has a specific opportunity too. Yes, and this opportunity is specifically for Howard, Bison, my students, my alumni, my uh, faculty, the staff, my, uh, my Bison adjacent uh, family, the one who got a cousin that, and, you ha and you rock the sweatshirt, this is for you. Um, we are hosting at When We All Vote and Howard University Alumni Association is hosting a voting squad training. And this is where you're going to be able to learn about how you can make change in your community right now. Uh, Dr. Grant mentioned, you know, get in the ring and, and, and figure out what where your role is to fight. And Dr. Scott said, you know, we have a history and we need to support and, and really um, and 
and leverage our history and, and, and jump in the ring. How are you going to be able to jump in the ring? We have a training coming up this Wednesday, this Wednesday at 8 p.m., uh, and we would like for you to attend. It's only one hour and it's free. How are people? We love a good free training. And guess what? Michelle Obama's voting initiative is going to train you on how you can use your resources right now in COVID-19 to register voters. You don't need to be you don't need to be a genius for this. All you need to do is to jump on this training this Wednesday at 8 p.m. And the way to join that training is we all dot vote not, not dot com we all dot vote backslash bison squad okay that's b-i-s-o-n-s-q-u-a-d that is our bison squad we're gonna be squatting up for our voting squad training this wednesday at 8 p.m that's your first step you're gonna learn how to register yourself register your community and you how to leverage your social platforms during this coronavirus to increase voter registration. Just to be very frank with you, coronavirus has made voting registration very different, difficult and different this year. We're not knocking on doors. We're not setting up tables in the same ways that we used to, but let's get creative. The option to not vote is not an option that is present. Our job is to make sure that we get in front of everybody the best way possible and join the upcoming training to do that. Absolutely. Shout out to the Howard adjacent. If you just came to homecoming two years in a row, never went to Howard, you're invited to. Please, please come. Dr. Scott, any, any questions, thoughts that people need to keep in mind as we talk about next steps? Yes, yes. Uh, I think people need to be involved. And you can get involved with candidates, you know, with the nonpartisan show here, but we can talk about the need to support candidates that you believe in. And if you believe in the candidate, then you need to spend some money there. We often don't contribute. And then when a person get elected, they won't meet with you and say, okay, did you ever contribute? Did you ever go down and, and uh, vote? Uh, did you ever go down and get out to vote for them? And so they don't know you because you have never called them, you never talked to them. And then after they had elected, you haven't come to the city council hearings or what have you. So find the ways, all the ways you can to be involved. This year, there's a dire need for poll watchers and poll monitors because so many people are afraid. And many of our young people are not afraid. They go out and demonstrate. We go out to parties. So if you go out to parties, then maybe you might consider becoming a poll watcher because you can get paid. And most of the poll watchers now in their 70s and 80s. So we need some young people because they'll give you gloves, they'll give you masks and all those kind of things to uh, work the polls. And so if you want to see, and you are a poll monitor, you want to see the backside of voting day, then sign up with one of the organizations and become a, become a poll monitor. But there are so many ways to get involved besides just voting. And there are other, you know, there are ways to get involved, even if you are, uh, even if you don't want to work the polls, there are a lot of, uh, if you're a lawyer, you can join one of the voter protection groups and work the phones all day, handling case, handling calls. And then there are groups, you know, the NAACP and other voter protection organizations. They will have people on the phones all day taking calls from people calling and saying, I've been turned away and helping people to direct to get provisional ballots and all those kinds of things. So I would say that, you know, get online, go to the various websites that show you what you can do in order to get involved and get involved. And to our students at Howard, make certain you vote, make certain that you vote. If you're not registered today, most places you can still get, but there's still enough time to get registered. So get registered, vote, and vote for people who you think will help your community. And the last word to Dr. Grant. Yeah, I think those are two like great things. I love what Ms. Johnson is talking about in terms of getting training, because I think it's often the case that we have all this energy, but we don't know what to do with it. And so that they are going to tell you, like, literally, this is what you should do. I think that's great. Uh, and I think Dr. Scott is right, too, about like there being different ways to engage. One of my first 
kind of activist type things, participations in the protests after I got to Howard was with Freddie Gray in Baltimore. A group of students went down to Baltimore and there was a woman with a cooler passing out Capri Suns and sandwiches. And she said, you know, y'all young people can go march, right? Like you can go do that. And I am going to contribute by passing out these free Capri Suns and sandwiches. And so I just thought that was a great like demonstration that there's space for all talents in the movement. And so if you're the grandma who just likes to chef it up, please do that and bring it, right? Bring it to the polls, make sure that people have sustenance while they're waiting. But I think from the scholarly perspective, one of the, the thing I'll leave you with is that we know that increased engagement with individuals increases the likelihood that they will participate through registration or through actual casting of a ballot. And so if you have told your auntie like, hey auntie, are you registered to vote? And she was like, yeah, girl, I'm gonna get to it later. You have to follow up with auntie like three or four more times. You have to follow up with uncle four or five times to make sure that they actually follow through. And so they might get irritated with you, but I think everybody will feel better when they have, as Dr. Scott says, people who represent their interest. And so it might be a little irritating to keep getting all this information and to be the person who is always beating the drum of participation but we need you to do it and we need you to do it multiple times because we know that that is what works to get people out. Wow, that's, that's spot on feedback and guidance. I appreciate all of you. And just one last reminder, Priestley Johnson, the training is this Wednesday, August 26th. Can you just share one more time? How do people go? Yeah, this Wednesday, August 26th at 8 p.m. So it's after your work day. It's gonna be at a great time. And this is Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> And it is if in order to get to the training, you're gonna go to we all dot vote, not dot com, we all dot vote backslash bison squad. And one word together, one little thing. And it's also gonna be in the follow-up email to this training. It is we all dot vote backslash uh, bison squad. So sign up now, RSVP now. We got want to get you in the doors. We want to get you the resources, and it's gonna be a fun training, and we're gonna have a good time with uh, some special guests and some secret surprises. So please join us. It's gonna be uh, it's gonna be something you're not gonna want to miss. So thank you all, and I hope you will join us. All right, Priestley Johnson, Kanisha Grant, Elsie Scott, excellence in truth and service. You see it right here on your screen. And a thank you to Bilal Badruddin and Sharon Strange Lewis in the Development and Alumni Relations Office for pulling us together today. Hope you found the conversation informative. Y'all stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you.